So let, let's just start with a little bit of the kind of your essential love of film and the films that you saw, the, fir- the films that really made an impression on you and first gave you that feeling that of what cinema could do and also maybe gave you an inkling of what you might be able to do in cinema. Yeah, I mean, I think the first film I actually remember going to see, I was very young, was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, at, I think it was the Muswell Hill Odeon, which is now on every man. Might have been the Holloway, Holloway Odeon. Um, and I remember very clearly being affected by it, particularly the scene where um, the evil queen turns into an old crone you know, with a poison apple, being very frightened of that, sort of hiding behind the seats. Um, I think as far as influential movies and things that sort of show me the, the potential of films, uh, it was a very uh, special time in terms of blockbusters. So George Lucas's first Star Wars was came out when I was seven years old, and um, The Spy Who Loved Me was the Bond film at the time. I remember going to see that in the cinema. Uh, and those are the kind of films that I think a lot of filmmakers, you know, you come to film through the Hollywood blockbuster. Those are the big films that, you know, as a kid you wound up going to see. Um, I did have a very special experience of going to see 2001 uh, on a film print because Star Wars was so successful. They, they re-released that film the year after that. So I went to see that with my dad in uh, Leicester Square, at the old uh, Leicester Square Theatre. It would have been on, on 70 mil. Um, and that was a film, I, I remember that experience very clearly. I remember just feeling the enormity of the image and, and the potential for that screen to kind of you know, just take you anywhere. Um, yeah. And I guess seeing it at, at that age, it's a, or indeed any age with 2001, it's, it is a question of, of you experiencing it rather than understanding every frame of it. it it's a kind of cumulative yeah. effect, isn't it? I think, I mean, I saw it when I was seven years old and I, I think I understood it certainly as well then as I do now, maybe better. <laughs> I think maybe better because you just, you take it for granted, you experience it and the, the beauty and the magnitude of the images and, and the feeling of, you know, traveling across the solar system or whatever. I mean, that, that's the point of the film. It's a sort of wood for the trees thing. I think as a kid, you're actually pretty open to those visceral experiences. Uh, and I think a lot of your appreciation of movies and the entertainment value of movies is very, uh, simple and it's just experiential in that way, yeah.
did you also appreciate film as a kind of time machine as well, in that it 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 sort of it does capture and transcend time. It can you know somebody can die over and over again in film, can't they? <laughs> yes, they can indeed. Whole... Yeah, I mean, I think some years ago it was doing a, uh, an event in India with my friend uh, the artist Tasta Dean, who works on 60 millimeter film, and has been very involved with me and, and with the BFI in, in film preservation. That is to say trying to preserve the medium of, of film for future generations, uh, for acquisition and, and for projection. Uh, and she pointed out that, that the camera literally sees time. And the more I thought about what she said, and I applied it to my own fascinations and my own interest in it for, for work, I mean, you know, it's only in a post-film world where you can conceive of slow motion or fast motion or things running backwards you know these are things that uh, people before movies wouldn't have had any any idea of or any thought of and was that so that was something that you first appreciated through film rather because it was literature that you studied at, at university but it was film that I did but I mean I mostly was making films and you know thinking about films you know getting by in literature but uh, yeah I mean uh, my interest in films has always been sort of overwhelming in terms of anything else going on in my life and, and when I got to UCL uh, where I went to college it was a film society a student run film society in the basement of the Bloomsbury Theatre it's still there today and, and you were able to shoot 16 millimeter films and uh, and then in the Bloomsbury Theatre upstairs we would project 35 millimeter films and use the proceeds from that to pay for filmmaking. So even though I was, yes, sort of studying English literature, I think I spent most of my time making films, actually. And clearly, you were attracted to film noir as a, early on, as mm. a, a because, which I suppose is a kind of expression of, of the human, in the human psyche, as it is, as, as much as being any, having any kind of thriller content, and film noir and, and psychoanalysis kind of grew up together grappling, didn't they? As yeah, I, no, I think I think to a degree. Yeah, I mean, I think film noir certainly. I think the attraction of that genre, particularly to a younger filmmaker starting out, is it is it works at its best as an extrapolation of relatable fears and anxieties. And that's really the bedrock of, of the attraction of that genre for audiences. And so, when you're younger starting out, and you don't know anything, you haven't experienced anything. Being able to extrapolate from your own. Uh, fears and anxieties into, into a more universal realm, a more universal language. Uh, that's a really important tool for, for a filmmaker. So when you came to make Memento, 
which mm. was, um, I, you know, I mentioned following in the introduction, which had obviously a noir kind of, the, the step then to Memento, which was, as it were, the breakthrough film. Again, very much uh, a kind of noir, but about memory in some ways, in a very, a very complex sense. So what made you want to make a film, as it were, where the chronology was backwards? Well, I think, you know, in the noir tradition, there, there is a tradition of amnesiac films um, that, that Memento was certainly inspired by and tapping into, but it's based on a short story that my brother wrote and, and told me about as he was writing, in fact. And um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's essentially dealing with somebody who can't make new memories. Um, and ultimately what we decided uh, what I decided in talking to my brother about it and tasked him within finishing his story is if you could tell the story subjectively, that would surely be the most interesting way of you know, trying to live in, in somebody's head like that. Um, and so he in his story found ways to approach that. Um, and me in the, in the screenwriting, you know, uh, ultimately uh, I decided that if you inverted the chronology, um, you know, then you'd put yourself in the position of somebody who doesn't know what's just happened. I mean, the revenge story is, you know, it's a staple of, of movies and, and literature generally and, and noir fiction in particular. And so it always raises interesting ethical questions. And I think Memento, more than any film I've made, really tries to suggest that uh, the ethical framework of the dilemma is defined really by the point of view. So it really is a question of whether you're in his head or whether you're observing him from outside in terms of how you judge the ethics of, of how he's behaving. So following on from Memento, you, you made Insomnia, which was, had originally been, there was a Norwegian film, and this, is, this was the mm. Hollywood um, version of this. So you were working at that stage from somebody else's script, which is, you then, you're done with that after that. But um, I suppose Insomnia still felt a bit like, you know, you were dealing with something that had originally been a kind of art house film, but then you go to the Dark Knight trilogy, Mm -hmm. which that's introduced you obviously to, to Warner Brothers and then you go to the Dark Knight trilogy. Was that a big decision to go from some, you'd made such personal films until then, I know you were still starting out, was that something that you and Emma mm -hmm. Thomas discussed as you know what you should do next? How no, not really, I mean I think the, the notion of personal or not personal doesn't really apply to my work, they're all equally personal and, and actually I mean the interesting thing with Insomnia was it was a remake of, of yeah, a very brilliant Norwegian film. Um, and Hilary Seitz, who is credited with the screenplay, she had written a great adaptation of the original film. And then she worked with me. Uh, I was a great creative partner in rewriting. I then did the last draft myself. I didn't take a credit uh, because she had done you know, the vast majority of the work, so that seemed appropriate. Um, but I did write the, the last draft, and I do on all of my films. And so my relationship with the material is no different, really, than any other film um, I've been involved with, because some of them are adaptations, some of them are original. That one was a remake. Some have been sequels. 
uh, some are from novels. You know, I mean, it's it's always always different, um, and yet the process has to be always the same in terms of finishing that last draft and then me approaching it as a director. Uh, so no, I think where you see a more specific progression and that was probably a little more, not necessarily uh, self-conscious, but the scale of the films, you know, grows in what for me was a very useful uh, cadence because we went from a no budget film, you know, following was literally made, you know, with friends shooting on the weekend, we were all working, you know, full time jobs um, and it was made for nothing. Uh, and then Memento was a you know a low budget movie, but uh, you know it was about four million dollars or so. Um, and then Insomnia was sort of ten times that. So then by the time we get to the Dark Knight trilogy, starting with Batman Begins, we're working on a much bigger scale. But it was a, a pretty good progression actually. Um, so I felt I was challenged at every stage with taking on something bigger. Um, but I didn't do what. A lot of filmmakers, since you know, I did those films, um, there've been a lot of filmmakers who've gone from their sort of whatever their memento is straight to their Batman Begins, and that's a very difficult leap. And I would not have wanted to have to try and make that kind of technical leap in terms of marshalling resources and everything. I feel very lucky to have done a, a more modestly budgeted studio film and learned a lot about how to make that work and working within that system before I then you know, took on their, their larger scale properties. And your vision for Gotham City and, and Bruce Wayne's travails was um, informed quite a lot by sort of European expressionism, <laughs> by Fritz Lang, I mean. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think <laughs> Lang's influence was more on the Dark Knight, actually. I think with Batman Begins, uh, on the design, working with Nathan Crowley, who I worked with for years, um, we, he very much wanted to take it in a modernist direction. And I liked that and enjoyed that. And it, we pushed a little bit in that direction. But I felt that given the history of Batman, how he'd been portrayed on film before, even though we we're trying to do something different, I didn't want to completely abandon the sort of gothic underpinnings of it quite so much. And so Batman Begins was more of a hybrid in that sense. Um, and then by the time we got to The Dark Knight, we'd sort of built more confidence to take it in our own direction and push in a, in a very heavily sort of moder modernist direction. And for the script, more than the design really, I pushed my brother, who wrote the first draft of The Dark Knight, um, I pushed him very much in the direction of, of Fritz Lang, looking at Dr. Mabusa and things like that. Um, this idea of the sort of master criminal in you know, expression of cinema, the relationship between the city uh, and, and the master criminal. And I think it, it, it gave him a lot of inspiration, actually. Um, I think visually that, that isn't necessarily as strong a relationship. I think it's a little bit more about almost sort of the, the, the morality of the thing, really, and, and the relationship between police and you know, a criminal underworld. Um, and then the idea of some kind of geographical or, or architectural expression of that within the, the visual nature of the film. Uh, but obviously we were doing it in a more, more modern way, I suppose. And also the kind of Faust <laughs> themes as well, in that Bruce Wayne takes on this, this mantle of Batman at, at some considerable personal cost, doesn't he? There's a price. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's yeah, it is a sort of deal with the devil. I mean, it's, it's really that idea of a sort of means to an end, if you like. And I think the Batman mythology, one of the reasons that it's continually interesting and is continually reinvented by new generations of comic book writers and artists and, and filmmakers, uh, is because that essential paradox or that essential idea of uh, a good vigilante, you know, somebody who feels that they have to resort to criminal methods or be outside the system in order to fix the system. Uh, it's endlessly complex and interesting in, in its ethics.
Were you surprised by the appeal of the Joker to audiences, how fascinated they were by him? I mean, no, I wasn't, because when I read Jonah's first draft, which was, it was a very unwieldy document, and it, you know, uh, it was it was long and, and it took us a long time to kind of get it into a practical shape. But the character of the Joker was there, like this sort of engine running through it. Um, I had told him I needed the Joker to be like the shark in Jaws. He needed to sort of come through and thread through the film in this with this particular energy. And he had just found that and absolutely cracked that, even in that first draft. And then when I brought Heath on and talked about it and how it was going to work and saw his ideas and his references and as a, that started to come together um, it was endlessly fascinating you know, very very interesting to see and as we shot with Heath you know, right from the first hair and makeup test you could see everybody on the floor just fascinated by it I mean it was just such a sort of interesting creation um, and it started with Jonah's script and then Heath's interpretation was so compelling um, that no, I think we all felt as we were filming it that that character would have very, very special appeal. And I think the challenge actually of, of the film and the edit was to have all of the other elements in balance with that. And so, you know, Christian Bale and Gary Oldman and everything, you know, their story, you know, you can't give it all over to the Joker, even though he's this incredibly magnetic and powerful force at the, the center of it. Um, but no, I think we all sort of felt that really developing as we were as we were making the film. Yeah, I guess that the challenge is that billionaire Bruce Wayne is, is you know, in some ways a less attractive figure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in cinematic terms. Anyway. Well, and, but I mean, a good villain. I mean, the devil has the best tunes. You know, that's that's the thing, and and. Um, it, it's what really, as I say, it's the engine of the film, it's what really makes it work. Um, so we all knew how important it was going to be, um, but it was, it was thrilling to see audiences really, really respond to that. Of course, there have been all sorts of interpretations from right or left about appropriating the Joker one way or another. I mean, what do you make of those? Uh, politically speaking? Yeah. Well, I mean, we found that on, on all three films. People often attempting to put some kind of political interpretation on the films, but it sort of ignores the mythic landscape in which it takes place. Certainly with Dark Knight Rises, which, you know, has its share of people pulling at it politically right and left. Um, either side of the political spectrum in choosing to, to interpret the film in their own terms. They're willfully ignoring, you know, big chunks of the story to do that or big chunks of the point of view. Um, so really it's important to remember the mythic landscape. Uh, the end of The Dark Knight is really drawn from Shane, the Western, you know, George Stevens' wonderful Western, and out of the past, you know, so it's, it's mythic Americana, it's film noir, it's the Western. I think where people get slightly confused by it, or in that sense, is, is that it's a contemporary staging, um, because that's what, what works for, for Batman. But even though it's a recognizable sort of contemporary American cityscape, 
emotionally, you know, thematically, it's it's the mythic Americana of, you know, crime fiction and and of the Western. <laughs> I mean, nonetheless, it, it, the films did anticipate the rise of kind of disruptor leaders in politics all around the world, didn't they? So do you, do you think they were sort of of their time in, in Oh, I think they're very much, that? yeah, very much of their time uh, in that, I mean, certainly with David Goya, my co-writer, with my brother Jonah, my other co-writer, the attempt was always to just be honest about presenting the things we were affected by, things we were worried about, afraid of. <laughs> Um, I mean, certainly when I look back at Batman Begins, there's a heavy emphasis on, on terrorism, on the sort of post 9-11 world, but we, it wasn't something we were consciously putting into the film. We were just trying to be sincere and truthful about what moved us at the time. Um, certainly, The Joker for me and, and The Dark Knight is all about uh, a fear of anarchy, you know, fear of the rules breaking down and, and what that would do to society. Uh, and The Dark Knight Rises is very much fearful of fascism, fearful of demagoguery. And, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I suppose in a sense we were sort of tuning into things around us in the world that we were worried about and, and you know, some of them come to pass, you know. So obviously you made other films during during that mm. trilogy as well. Um, did the fantastic success, I mean, the, the huge box office takings of those films allow you to do something like Inception, for example, which you know, was very daring cinematically? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely helped, yeah. Um, sure. I mean, <laughs> coming off the Dark Knight, I, I think I've been working on Inception for a very long time. Um, I never really tried sort of pitching it to the studio or anything, so I'd never really gauged the response in the absence of Dark Knight. I'd probably been afraid to. Uh, but certainly following that film, when I took it to the studio, they were, you know, they were very receptive. They wanted to, to do another film with us. So 
um, that smoothed the way for what might otherwise have been received um, with some raised eyebrows. Because it, it is a, it's an unusual film and a complicated film uh, and a very expensive film, uh, which is a, a tricky combination. And so I think both Emma, myself, Emma Thomas, my producer and wife, coming off the dark night that we had a very, very unusual opportunity to make something on a large scale with, I mean, not carte blanche, but with a lot of freedom. And so we, we sort of dove in head first to, to do Inception because um, you're very aware when you get an opportunity like that. I mean, firstly, how much you yourself have wanted to do uh, something very ambitious like that, but also how many other filmmakers there are in the world who don't have that opportunity. So um, you really feel, you know, kind of a, an obligation almost to, to just take a risk and maximize it. Something else that obviously was, was happening um, around the time in terms of thinking about IMAX as a format, because mm. um, clearly you know, you're getting into an area where these films are just extraordinary. Was it something that you had in mind when you go to make a film? Are you thinking about that particular format? Yeah, depending on the film. I, I had first experience IMAX as a kid uh, in museums around the world. Actually. Omnimax, which is the variant of IMAX, it's a dome theatre um, that isn't. There's not much of it around anymore. But uh, in various museums uh, in America, they they had this format. You'd watch nature documentaries and things. And I always found it to be a very visceral, sort of overwhelming experience. I thought, well, why not make a film that way? And as I started to get into to film, there was there was no way to do that. But right around, you know, in, in the sort of 10 years leading up to Batman Begins, you know, when I was in my early 20s, um, IMAX started showing, they, they created a process called the DMR process, whereby they could take a, a regular 35 mil film and blow it up for their screens. So they started building IMAX theaters in commercial cinemas uh, for the first time. And so by the time we got to Batman Begins, I was able to say to the studio, well, can we transfer this? We couldn't shoot in IMAX. No one had ever shot in a thing in IMAX for, for those screens. But then you had to transfer it. And so I got to meet the IMAX guys blowing up Batman Begins, and, and you know it did well in that format. So leading up to The Dark Knight, I went to them and, and said, I'd like to take your cameras that have been used for you know, nature documentaries. And you know they'd gone to outer space and up Mount Everest and all this other stuff. But no one had ever shot a narrative feature with them. Uh, and so we started looking into it, and it was a it was a very large undertaking because no one had done it. There were a lot of a lot of unknowns, a lot of fears about it. Um, but I had read a, an interview with uh, James Cameron years before, where he had talked about whether you could make a film on IMAX and how that would work in terms of and what he'd figured out. Cameron, being the technical genius he is, is that you'd extract from the larger negative the smaller negative that you'd need for your regular release. So rather than doing different versions or whatever, you, you'd have one definitive version that you could you could uh, transfer to your other distribution formats. And that stuck in the back of my head. So when we came to do it on the dark night, we, we figured out how to do that, how to shoot an IMAX negative, which is a you know, very tall frame, but frame within that uh, protect for uh, a cinemascope version. Um, and make it work in that way and figure out which sequences we could shoot that way. Uh, the cameras are very loud, so you don't really want to do dialogue scenes that way. So we laid out which of the action set pieces we would shoot with the IMAX camera, starting with the opening of the film where we introduced the Joker. Um, and yeah, we, we went ahead and did that. And uh, it was, you know, it was a great success and kind of moved the, the format forwards. And, and I've been working in that format ever since because I, I just love it. And that's really where the film begins with you, with the IMAX version, is it? I mean, is that what you're thinking, as it were? I mean, <laughs> yes and no. It, it depends on which sequences you're, you're in. Um, it's pushed us over the years. I'd certainly work with Hoyte van Hoytema, as I had for, have for the last 10 years or so, 
Um, by the time we get to Oppenheimer, our conversations are a lot about uh, not, it, it pushes you to a way of looking at cinematography where you're not looking at the proscenium, you're not looking at the frame and making two dimensional compositions. You're really just putting the camera in proximity to the actors and you're composing in a three dimensional sense. You're sort of composing situationally and then that gets formatted to different shape screens and, and holds up great. And Hoyter has a wonderful eye for that. So in its IMAX version, the extreme top and bottom, it, it's really about the peripheral vision. It's really kind of filling out the frame rather than boxing it in. Um, so it's less a question of seeing things get boxed into particular compositions and more a question of pulling the frame away for that version. Uh, and so it translates, I think, very well to the other formats as well uh, for that reason. Um, so yeah, no, it's been, it's been a, a sort of ongoing experiment that we, we quite enjoy. <laughs> Interstellar. There was a treatment by the physicist uh, Kip Thorne, I believe, which is sort of the basis, is it where, where you start, which is to do with relativity and gravity and time, well, all, all of those things. Is that where you began? Well, when, Kip, and there was no, I mean, Kip had an ambition to, the genesis of the project was Kip uh, had an ambition to see a Hollywood film made based on scientific principles. And so he was friends with the producer Linda Obst, and they had sort of taking this idea to Steven Spielberg. And Steven hired my brother to write it. And so for years, I was aware of Jonah developing this project, writing about it, and so he would talk to me about it. And, and I thought it was pretty, pretty exciting. And then ultimately, Steven moved on, did something else, and so it became available. And I, I went to Jonah and said, you know, how would you feel if I took this and combined it? I had a couple other script ideas that I wanted to combine it with. Um, and he was willing to sort of, you know, let me do that, and then we managed to negotiate with the studio so that we could uh, take it on. Uh, and that's kind of where the, you know, the project really came from. Um, and in the finished film, you know, the whole setup, the whole world of it, the whole first act is, is pretty unchanged from what Jonah developed over the years. Uh, and I worked very closely with Kip, uh, who would work with my brother, and then when I took it over, um, I worked closely with him as well to try and 
really mine his incredible brain for what are the possibilities of science? Uh, what do concepts of relativity uh, offer you for a narrative? And Jonah had identified early on in talking to Kip and, and researching it, he looked at a lot of Einstein's, Albert Einstein's sort of thought experiments. They tend to be very narrative, so they tend to involve a set of twins, you know, and one goes off on a spaceship or whatever, one goes off on a train, one is left at the station, and they come back in the different ages, and there's a sort of weird melancholy to them almost. Uh, and so a lot of that fed into his idea of what, what the story should be. And then I just kind of borrowed in, you know, further and further with Kip on the relationship between quantum physics and classical physics and, you know, gravitational theory and all this stuff. And a lot of what, you know, he, he came back with was truly stranger than fiction, uh, really mind-blowing stuff. Um, in visual terms, it found its ultimate expression in the look of the black hole in Interstellar, which Kip insisted he wanted to talk to the visual effects guys about it and everything. And I sort of was a bit worried about that because ultimately you want something that kind of looks cool. You don't necessarily <laughs> <laughs> really matter if it's scientifically accurate. But what Kip had figured out, Kip had all of the equations that would explain, you know, that would define how the gravitational effect of the black hole would affect the light behind it and, and how it would therefore look. He just really needed the computing power of our visual effects company to, to render that. And so uh, he worked very closely with Paul Franklin, our visual effects supervisor. Uh, and they created this incredibly uh, realistic rendering of a black hole. Uh, they actually published a couple of different scientific papers jointly about it. Uh, and then some years later, they actually managed to photograph a black hole in real life. And it was on the front of the New York Times, and I looked at it, and I called Kip, and I said, well, I guess you were right. <laughs> you know, uh, very glad to see that you were right, and our black hole holds up. And yeah, it's sort of become the, the, the kind of standard way of, of looking at it now. But it was all based on absolutely the real the real science so it's all moving towards Oppenheimer I guess isn't it in, in the sense of mm. wanting to make that story of the father of the atom bomb and the, and the discovery of that force um, to make us feel as they were there for it is that right I think yeah I mean I think with all my films I've had an increasing desire to really try and create an immersive experience and try and create a tactile sense of of a world and, and, you know, put you there in it. Uh, and I think that where that finds its, maybe its ultimate utility in Oppenheimer is the, the excitement or the tension of that story was always going to be based on, you know, can you actually be there for the Trinity test? Can you be in that room with these scientists deciding to go ahead and, and do this thing uh, and experience those, those stakes? Because obviously it's a story that's ultimately it's about you know, people talking in rooms. It's not the most obviously cinematic, but the Trinity test itself in particular, if, if you can really feel that you're there for that, uh, it, it would have been just the most extraordinary moment in history you know, to be there and the tension of that you know, felt like it would be uh, inarguable. And so, yeah, I think I, I think I brought my experience to bear in terms of uh, creating that tension, creating that sense of being there. There's a lot of detail work and things that, that go into uh, you know, feeling uh, the tension around it, feeling that you're there. Um, as I pointed out to, to Jen Lame, my editor, it's the second film I've done with her, but I said the thing I've learned about editing suspense is it's very tedious to edit, actually, <laughs> because you have to repeat things a lot. You have to sort of keep showing the same thing advancing at a particular pace and you have to tune that pacing to to the audience and so lee smith who cut the clip which is seen in interstellar there's a lot of a lot of work on how slow to make the robot relative you know to the wave coming and, and all the rest and um you have to be very mechanical and pedantic about how you put those sequences together so that the audience can understand what they need to for the tension
21st century, is the role of film, or, or do you see the role of your films, to somehow make imaginable what has hitherto been unimaginable? Um, possibly even to show things that are, you know, even maybe to get as far as sort of like the inevitable, the things that cannot be expressed in any other form except cinema. Well, I think that's the ideal if you're, if you're making a film, uh, is to take on something that can only really exist in this form. Um, yeah, I mean, I do look for subjects that lend themselves to that. And I think that with Oppenheimer, the translation of a relatively academic source material, a piece of history, to something more immersive and more visceral um, is what made it special for me and, and interesting to me. Uh, because, yeah, I think you are looking for subjects that do in some way try to use cinema for to do something that a radio play or a stage play or a television program couldn't do. Um, one of the most sort of pure cinematic experiences I've, I've had actually is working with Andrew Jackson as the visual effects supervisor on this. He was, after Emma, he was the first person I showed the script to because you know, I wanted him to be able to produce all this imagery in an analog sense. So there's no computer graphics and any of the things cut into that scene. They're all things that he found a way to photograph um, because I felt that he wanted something that would have the texture of the rest of the film and have a kind of real world threat to it and beauty to it um, and I wanted to really get inside his head and imagine you know what those things could be and have a language of, of immersive cinema that would allow the audience to, to see things through his eyes in a sense and so Andrew spent months and months himself and Scott Fisher the special effects coordinator working together just trying all of these different experiments but but everything in there including you know the entire world been caught on fire that's all stuff that, that he photographed one way or another it's it's not cg at all it's we use computers for compositing and stuff with these elements that he would shoot um but he would do all kinds of just crazy sort of mad laboratory kind of stuff with things floating in liquids and setting fire to things and you know all sorts it was uh, it was a lot of fun
thank you so much indeed for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.